Associate Professor Peter from uh, University uh, Arizona University Faculty of English, right? You are also one of the old friends of Secret. Uh, it's, it's too bad uh, you guys cannot join in here with us. Um, the Miyajima is just getting sunny right now. Good morning all. Peter Goggin here um, with my recorded uh, talk on Sublime Islands, Discursive Entanglements and Redefining the Picturesque. And I hope that you're not actually watching this recording, that you're watching my live presentation because in this recording there are no uh, slides, uh, which is kind of odd, of course, if I'm talking about the picturesque and there are no actual pictures. Anyway, let's get going. My talk today is a rhetorical lens on constructs and discourses on the picturesque in tropicalized islands. It is a mashup of some earlier work I presented on, at an island conference in Hong Kong and an article published in Shima this spring on place naming and the case of Bermuda, which, full disclosure, happens to be my home country. In their analysis of rural rhetorics and literacies, Donna Hauerhog and Shell point to a phenomenon of commonplace assumptions constructed through an urban or mainstream worldview they term rurality. Mimi Shella and Krista Thompson create a, uh, equate a similar phenomenon for oceanic islands, the Caribbean in particular, and let's call it islandality, that is in large part informed by colonial and post-colonial imagery that has defined island natural landscapes, the people and their cultures as picturesque and thus relegated as consumable places within the global system. Scheller observes that such a view constitutes a rhetoric of presence that fixes the master of uh, the seer over the scene. The term picturesque comes from an 18th century notion of seeing landscapes, architecture, and even lifestyles literally as a constructed picture, or as the OED describes, quote, fit to be the subject of a striking or effective picture, possessing pleasing and interesting qualities of form and color, but not implying the highest beauty or sublimity." Quote. As architect Raymond Isaac puts it, the notion of the picturesque quote is embedded in the tradition of English empiricism, which emphasized experiential sensor, sensory input and reflection rather than the universal truths of Cartesian rationalism. <clears throat> The picturesque perception of island people and ecologies constitutes a form of world-making that reinforces a sense of timeless dissonance for the mainstream or mainland uh, worldview. Thompson further argues that cultures and ecologies are drastically altered as islanders themselves buy into the very same market and influences of mainland interests, which she terms tropicalization. A tropicalization in the island narrative is a pervasive theme in Western American and European imagination, and I specify the Western imagination here as some scholars have made the case that the fascination with islands is something separate and irresistible from the concept of a mainland, what Gillis, Brinklow, and others refer to as, as, as islomania, and this is a term originally coined by the author Lawrence Durrell, um, that is rooted, is, is rooted in Western mythology and Western religious ideology. <clears throat> Baldacino, Conklin, and others refer to the related concept of islandness as boundedness and isolation. Popular adventure, romance, mystery, and thriller novels such as Robinson Crusoe, The Carl Island, Swiss Family Robinson, Treasure Island, and film dramas such as Mutiny on the Bounty, Lost, numerous James Bond films, Castaway, and Letters from Iwo Jima, have fueled tropical and subtropical island locales as rhetorical constructs for swashbuckling romance action, intrigue, and survival. Discourse on the geographies, environments, histories, and people associated with islands can spark powerful associations with these narrative tropes in the popular imagination. 19th century Victorian era romanticism, for instance, in, for example, fueled popular fa fascination with fairy tales and a trend of fairy-themed place naming in Britain and its colonies and territories. The idealizing of small islands that serve colonial interests as plantations, prisons, military outposts, and maritime trade posts as idyllic, picturesque fairy tale places, evoked attributes of empire while maintaining the status quo of dominant colonial culture. But such idyllic associations are often dramatically inflated in comparison to the actual socioeconomic status of small island communities and their status in contemporary multinational global contexts. Bermuda, for example, is regularly listed in the top 10 highest per capita income countries in the world, and certainly the standard of living is overall quite good. However, the cost of living index for Bermuda is estimated to be the highest in the world, and unless one is a member of the wealthy expatriate community or old money colonial families, essentials like utilities, 
uh, grocery bills and access to higher education are not so rosy. Now, just for comparison's sake, Bermuda's cost of living is estimated to be almost three times higher than for Japan, the country as a whole. As I suspect, most people here at this conference are well aware of, um, there is a big difference between the imagined romance of island dwelling and the day-to-day -day realities. What we have in the case of Bermuda, like many other developed islands, is that depend on offshore finance as the primary income rather than tourism, agriculture, and aquaculture is simultaneously contradictory and complementary intersections of the branding of picturesque traditional island imagery and neo-cosmopolitan island imagery. Now here the simulacra, simulacra meets the real. On one extreme we have the evocative beauty of the tropicalized island that appeals to the individual aesthetic senses, the aquamarine ocean, the twilight silhouette of a palm tree, uh, the untrodden stretch of sandy beach, all readily used by corporations for offshore investment and recruitment purposes. By contrast, the sublime qualities of the island, fear, dread, awe, and other reactions too overwhelming to be comprehended, can be felt through the imagery of dramatic isolation in the vastness of ocean, the legacy of maritime war and empire, the awesome power of the tropical hurricane, the sense of escape, or even imprisonment. And these romanticized ideals are manifest in visual and textual imagery in multiple forms and conceptions. They represent, whether in material form or mental images, both the constructed object, the island imagery, and a way of viewing and thus draws the object into a powerful rhetorical frame for conceiving islands informed by the picturesque. In his 1869 travelogue, Innocence Abroad, Mark Twain popularized Bermuda thusly. Quote, and then the beautiful Bermudas rose out of the sea. We entered the tortuous channel, steamed hither and thither amongst the bright summer islands, and rested at last under the flag of England, and were welcome. A few days among the breezy groves, the flower gardens, the coral caves, and the lovely vistas of blue water that went curving in and out, disappearing and anon again, appearing through the jungle walls of brilliant foliage, restored the energies dulled by long drowsing on the ocean, and fitted us for our final cruise. Irish poet Thomas Moore had this to say about Bermuda in 1804. But bless the little fairy isle, how sweetly after all our ills we saw the dewy morning smile serenely o'er its fragrant hills, and felt the pure elastic flow of airs that round this Eden blow. In 1880, steamship brochure branding passage to the islands wafts it seems like entering into fairyland as the steamer threads its way among the numbers of little islands which make new pictures at every turn, while the transparency of the water is a revelation in itself. Revelation in itself. End quote. The island ideals of place naming, along with cruise ship brochures and Beach Boy songs, mediates between the scenic beauty of islands and the sublime quality of aesthetics and emotions associated with idyllic life, adventure, and romance to evoke desired audience respond. Gronendijk, in her rhetorical analysis of landscapes and film versions of Austin's persuasion, points out that, quote, the picturesque object is not wild and awesome, nor is it tame and cultivated, end quote. And this notion of capturing and taming wild nature and simultaneously elevating its natural appeal is designed to evoke an intended and thus rhetorical reaction through the construction of an image. So the picturesque mediates between the extremes of the beautiful and the sublime, but what counts as picturesque it's, is itself not static, as 19th century landscape artists and architects may have defined it, but constantly in flux as values of what constitutes the sublime and picturesque beauty themselves are increasingly self-contradictory in evolving societies. Global complexity sociologist John Uri states that, quote, the analysis of globalization brings out the obvious interdependencies between peoples, places, organizations, and technological systems across the world. And he concludes, with the analysis of globalization, no place is an island, end quote. Now, here, Uri illustrates a limitation of mainland slash mainstream perspective in popular and scholarly discourse that situates ways of seeing islands and island perspectives as some place or thing outside of a dominant mainland global reality. A reframing of the picturesque and island imagery in terms of both global and local perspectives uh, provides a more robust understanding of the interconnected complexities of both global and local participation in the island landscape. 
friction zones between local knowledges or universals and global uh, or universals and global hegemonic perspectives offer an opportunity to complicate picturesque tropicalizing tropes. For islands competing in the global market, the intent of casting the place as picturesque is predominantly to promote commercial investment by mainland stakeholders through tourism and or commerce. The audience must be able to see themselves in the construction and in the case of commerce, offshore banking and refinance industries must also be able to see themselves in the local landscape. This requires that islands must hold a presence in the mainland perspective that they are made like pictures, at once places of adventure, possibility and potential, while also communicating a sense of stability and security. As Scheller observes, the picturesque quote is not simply a way of seeing, it is simultaneously a way of doing. Thompson explains in her analysis of the picturesque and images of tropicalized islands, quote, the making of the landscape into image was intrinsic to social and spatial control on the islands. Society as a whole for the ruling elite was thus made safe, not just for tourists, but for the status quo by becoming like a picturesque photographic image, end quote. Bermuda's most exclusive neighborhood, Fairylands, literally just spitting distance from the far less desirable industrialized neighborhood, Mill Creek, where that I grew up in, persists as an enclave for the very wealthy and almost exclusively white, preserved in all its idyllic picturesqueness at cost to surrounding low-income neighborhoods that buffer it from commercial growth. So to conclude, the picturesque is rhetorical as it requires a remaking, a reseeing, and reframing of the picturesque identity of the tropicalized island one that is both complementary and contradictory in the popular imagination. Bermuda, along with other tropicalized islands, serves as examples of the enactment of world-making in the never-ending construction of the archipelagic picturesque. I thank you, and uh, hope you all have a good conference. Bye-bye. Okay. So Peter, please go ahead. Um, yeah, okay, so I've been asked to, uh, to, to chair the rest of this panel. Um, so um, uh, first of all, before we get on to our next speaker, are there any, any questions uh, from the, the, those who are here this morning, this afternoon, um, on the talk that I just gave on the picturesque? Or observations or opinions? Any tickets? We had a lot of sake last night. <laughs> <laughs> they drink too much sake. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a little too early for me here, otherwise I'd probably wouldn't join it. All right. Um, let me, uh, let's, let's should we move on to the next speaker? Okay. okay. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, so it uh, looks like um, according to my notes here, that um, Genevieve um, Philip Darrow uh, is our next speaker, and uh, she is currently the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University College of Cayman Islands. Um, she is the book reviews editor for the Island Studies Journal, International Peer Review Journal, and board secretary for Silver Head of State, an international NGO which focuses on sustainability and renewable energy. And her talk, let me read it here real quick here, is. Let's see it here. Sorry, it's, on, it's not on my okay, I, will, my I, will, I will give you a co-host. Now you will be able to share your screen. Okay. Okay. So you um, that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Genevieve, if you want to just go ahead and introduce your topic and uh, please uh, we hear you talk. Yes, please go ahead and share your screen. And this will be the only presentation I want to try live. <laughs> Let's hope it all goes well. Good morning, everyone. It's 7.20 p.m. here in the Cayman Islands. I am Jeanine Philip Durham, and I am trying to share my window with you. Okay. Uh, it works a little bit. Let me just Is it fine? Yeah, we are yes, it works. 
please go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the great presentation, Peter. Um, my presentation this evening is entitled Trouble in Paradise, and we are moving from one British overseas territory, Bermuda, to the Cayman Islands. I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Recording in progress. Oh, thank you. So the image that you have in front of you is an area in the Cayman Islands known as Kamanabi. It's very developed, it is very modern, and it is pretty much a tourist attraction and for persons visiting or living in the Cayman Islands here. And as you can see, a lot of the Cayman Islands, like Bermuda, is known as a very important financial services hub when you think about financial services on a global scale. And many of the businesses that are located in the Kamanabe area here would be the big four companies, and this area really caters to the appetite and the interests of expats. Um, so I'll just share with you here, sorry that I don't have a better image of the Caribbean, so you can have a better idea that geographically where the Cayman Islands are located. So it comprises three islands, Grand Cayman, Little Cayman and Cayman Rock, just between Jamaica and Cuba in the Caribbean Sea. Um, so I just wanted to start by sharing a bit of a quote from the former Prime Minister of Tuvalu of one island that is under the threat of climate change. And this quotation states that these are the problems which we have done the least to create but now threaten the very heart of our existence. And by the time I get into the details of my presentation, you would have a better appreciation of how this quotation links to the Cayman Islands context. So just to say that my presentation this evening um, is related to a larger book project on climate change and climate governance in Latin America and the Caribbean. So this chapter that I will be contributing is the only one that looks at the Caribbean context and the case study is the Cayman Islands as I mentioned. So in the Caribbean region, as far as I am aware, the Cayman Islands is the only place that I know have a ministry dedicated specifically to sustainability and climate resiliency. The only other island that may have a ministry that is close to this might be Barbados because of that sustainability thrust and being part of the national priority for many persons may know Prime Minister Neil Motley, who has really been a strong advocate for the Caribbean region and managing sustainability and resilience issues. So one thing that's important to note is that regardless of the level of development, vulnerability continues to be at the forefront of discussions on size and survival among small island territories. So, it has been and continue to, continues to be the case for small island territories, regardless of where they are placed, that balance between resilience and vulnerability, and the Cayman Islands are no exception. So the Cayman Islands climate change policy spanned the time frame from 2011 to 2023. In fact, this month, or at the end of, no, early this month, we would have had another consultation on the climate change policy, but important to know that conversations around that policy would have commenced in 2011. So you can see it's been more than a decade later, the conversation is still ongoing on what that policy looks like. But I just wanted to point out three main goals of the policy. The first one being to reduce Cayman's vulnerability, and enhance resilience to climate change, so that speaks to adaptation. Goal number two speaks to mitigation, promoting sustainable low and zero carbon economic activity. And goal number three is to establish a governance framework for climate action that is future focused, fair to all, and accountable 
and transparent. So as I mentioned recently, we would have had another series of consultations on the policy and what those outcomes can look like, but understanding the urgency of adapting of mitigation efforts, I think we can appreciate that such a long lag in time frame between policy development and policy implementation, the challenges that that brings forward. There's also the national energy policy, which would have been a byproduct of the climate change policy. So that has a time frame of 2017 to 2037, and it's really a 20-year plan in terms of how energy governance would look for the Cayman Islands. So it's to ensure that energy and environmental governance is part of the island's framework for sustainable development. And I just want to go back to the initial photo that I shared, the image that I shared, just to share that if you, I don't know if anyone on the presentation, during the presentation, has been to the Cayman Islands, and you can see the level of infrastructural development and the overdevelopment in many respects, because it's a very small island again. The catering to persons who Cayman Islands is known as a hub for persons who want to live the luxurious and glamorous lifestyle. So the real estate is really expensive. The island itself is really expensive um, to live in the Cayman Islands. So I think the level of um, overdevelopment and giving, giving, yielding, giving way to the needs of the growing community of expats, it continues to drive up the value of the real estate. It continues to understandably so put pressures on the persons who want to have the exclusive oceanfront living and just it further compromises the health of the environment even in terms of the emissions, the number of cars, in relation to the number of persons on the island. So these are all very real concerns. It's in the Caribbean, it's always hot. We have two seasons, rainy season and dry season. So constantly people are using more demands for air conditioned units and so on. So you can understand the implications of those things for ensuring sustainable development is taking place against the backdrop of the level of infrastructural development. So the energy policy, going back to the energy policy, the other focus is to enhance capacity for adaptation. So it outlines the Cayman Islands commitment to a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. But based on what I shared there, it's challenging to reduce greenhouse gas emissions against the backdrop of level of development. Um, and producing environmentally friendly sources of energy is another part of this true ground approach. So, one, renewable energy, conservation methods, and the promotion of efficient energy. So the policy speaks on a number of these things, but the main question is how do we view the perennial problem with policy making in, sub, in small island developing states and subnational island jurisdictions such as the Cayman Islands? So the reality is that time waits on no one. And the perennial problem with policy making, as you can see, if we look at the time when the climate change policy was developed, and we look at the time when the national energy policy was developed, the urgency with which we should be tackling an issue like climate change that falls within the remit of a ministry that deals with sustainability, that urgency is not necessarily there if at a glance we were just to look at the time frames within which the policy implementation and the policy rollout is taking place. Um, this is not a situation that's unique to the Cayman Islands because as I can share with you, one issue is that Caribbean small island developing states and subnational island jurisdictions have challenges keeping a pace. A pace is an acronym for the ability to assess needs and to proactively plan, 
we do have a number of policies as you can see these are two policies so there's no shortage of policy but the implementation deficit becomes quite obvious when you do a survey of what takes place in the policy space in the Caribbean region specifically in terms of agency of course if you look at subnational island jurisdictions and the relationship that they have with their metropoles they are competing priorities, they are competing interests in these quasi governance types of arrangements. So they don't necessarily have the agency to be able to make or to prioritize certain policy decisions if you're in such a relationship where the metropolitan country kind of charters the course in terms of what you should prioritize. So you would find that sometimes these competing interests and priorities can become problematic. Capacity, there's a challenge with institutional capacity and institutional responsiveness. Like many other small island developing states, there's limited human resources. So in terms of the capacity for individuals to drive what institutions do, to drive the work of the ministry, and to be able to respond in a timely manner, that does not always happen. So of course you would have the bottom necking. And then added to that is the challenge of education. Traditionally, we have not insisted on having things like climate change and sustainable development built into the curriculum at every level. So persons who experience, who have this lived reality experience in subnational island jurisdictions and cities can really understand what that means for us, for our sustenance, for our lives and our livelihoods. There's also version two, which I spoke to initially, the overdevelopment. And this is coming from a former Minister of Education who is suggesting that in relation to the Cayman Islands, this is a quote from his analysis of the overdevelopment, we are not in control of the forces that run the economy and we do not know. And we know that he who pays the piper calls the tune. The agenda is re in reality not set by the elected legislature, but by the movers and shakers who shape the economy. And that is a very um, factual statement. Because of how capital is driven, and because Cayman Islands happens to be where it is and has developed based on a particular trajectory, you would find that you must ask yourself the question, based on the kind of development that you're seeing and the infrastructural development, the resources. Yes, we are all happy for the convenience, the modern conveniences that we have, the modern services and the modern goods that we have. But the question is, for whom are we developing? It's not necessarily for the average working class person in the Cayman Islands, because oftentimes working class persons can't afford these products and services that exist anyway. So you have the keeping up the situation as well as the overdevelopment that is equally challenging. Um, the proposed policy areas for the national energy policy, having a livable built environment, harmony with nature, a robust economy, healthy and resilient communities, and interwoven equity. And I just want to delve into both policies to give a synopsis in terms of the climate change policy. The new climate change policy agenda spans from 2023 to 2024. This is based on the recent survey results and feedback, the recent consultation, sorry. Um, the policy remained in draft and left recommended and left recommended longer term interventions today in the technical green paper. And which is climate change issues for Cayman Islands, so what a climate change policy, as well as the other one looking at vulnerability and capacity assessment. So this has been the case since initially when I told you it had just started. Um, notwithstanding, some components of the draft 2011 policy have been implemented. So for example, you have the National Conservation Act, which is one of the pillars that came out in 20 as well as the national energy policy. So there are some components of the initial policy that came along, but you find that with changes in administration, with the long lags again, 
the priorities sometimes shift, although it's still tackling the root of the issue, climate change, the changes in political administration and the times that have been allowed to lapse, you would find that the momentum is difficult to sustain. And again, in doing the new consultation, there was, that was based on the recognition that local views on and the understanding of climate change would have evolved in the interim. And the energy policy was under a five-year review. So the creation of the energy policy and a four to five-year review was meant to track and monitor policy implementation. So that is now under review, and that was to ensure that momentum was sustained because the target is 70% renewable energy by 2037. So the conversations and consultations around this policy began in 2013, but it was not again seven years later, 2020, 2021, that the public education campaign marketing strategy would have been developed to articulate what the strategic goals were and the vision of the policy. So this is just a sobering and gentle reminder of how much time we have left to treat with climate change and global warning, warming and for us to really understand based on our lived experience. I'm not from the Cayman Islands, but I, I'm from the Caribbean, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago and we all share the same or very similar vulnerabilities that are important for us to address from a policy standpoint. So I am constantly looking at ways in which we can improve our policy implementation, especially when it comes to our responsiveness to key vulnerabilities that exist throughout the region. So that's it for me. Thank you. And I invite any questions you may have. Do you have any questions from the uh, audience in this presentation? Yes, we have. Hey, thanks. Um, can you hear me okay? Maybe closer, sorry. specifically in the context of the work in and around climate change, the, the, uh, the, uh, the changes over the last 10 years in particular, do you think that the gap between development and implementation, more specifically the ability to implement policy, is increasing or decreasing? I am not sure I heard the question. I don't know, Peter, if you can, oh, I forgot you're not in the room. If someone can repeat that question, it was a bit muffled. Yeah, maybe just there up here. Uh, okay. I, I can't hear it either, so. I'm sorry, I'll try again. Can you hear me speaking now? It's a little better. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna yell now, I apologize. Okay, okay. perfect, I'm hearing you. So, uh, the question is, do you think that the gap between policy development and policy implementation is narrowing or widening in the context of concerns in and around climate change? Um, I would say, and it's, it's very, again, it's not, thank you for your question. Um, because many policy issues are politicized in a sense, and because you would find that policies would be the urgency to implement comes almost simultaneously with election cycles. Um, it may or may not be related, but I see now where we are closer to what an election cycle and where there's a lot of momentum in the community, I can see that that gap seems to be closing during this period, but I think it would be interesting to explore the extent to which you see the widening and the closing of that gap depending on time and place, time and place, time and space. 
So, but that is my observation again, not just with the Cayman Islands, but in the Caribbean in general, the agency to implement always accelerates when you are nearing to election periods. We have time for another question. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that talk, Genevieve. Um, You're welcome. As you, as you pointed out, Bermuda and Cayman have a lot in common, including a lot of these yep. expats who move backwards and forwards between those industries. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, our next speaker um, that I got listed here is Dr. Fred Schumann. Um, Fred, are you there in the room? Ah, oh, yeah, right here. Let me share ah, okay. his screen. Just wait a minute. Okay, so um, let me just introduce uh, Dr. Fred Schumann is a professor of global resources management at the University of Guam. He teaches courses in international tourism and tourism policy, uh, tourism policy planning and development and other tourism related courses. Dr. Schumann also serves as a graduate faculty member in the university's professional MBA program and his talk today is Demographics and Entrepreneurship in Guam, Identifying Startuppers for Sustainable Development in a Small Island Economy. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's, it's great to be in a room w filled with people interested in small islands. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I'm from Guam and um, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, demographics and entrepreneurship. Uh, this is a study with a um, co-author, uh, Dr. James G, who is a colleague at the University of Guam. Uh, so let me move on. Uh, here's an overview of what I will be talking about uh, this morning. I will focus on, of course, entrepreneurship, uh, but also uh, the importance of entrepreneurship in small islands, as well as uh, the importance of uh, entrepreneurship in, in tourism, in the tourism industry, uh, where you know most uh, small islands, uh, it's really the one viable uh, industry in many cases, uh, as we see in Guam and Saipan and Palau and many of the Micronesian islands. So a little background information, uh, Guam is an unincorporated territory of the United States. Uh, the population is approximately 154,000 and the island has a labor force of only about 65,000. Um, tourism is the primary industry and just before COVID hit, uh, uh, Guam received 1.6 million, a record uh, number of visitors um, in 2019. Uh, the primary source markets, the, the main ones, are South Korea with about, uh, the latest was 45% of the market share, and also Japan at, at 41%. Uh, so tourism is, I mean, Guam is a tourism-dependent economy with 60% of re the revenue coming from, from tourism, but there's also the U.S. military. Uh, Dr. Ikigami spoke about that uh, yesterday, and also there's government spending that uh, Guam relies on uh, quite heavily. Okay, um, let me also talk a bit about uh, small islands, uh, small business, and, and partic particularly uh, the tourism industry. In tourism, we, we see mainly small, medium-sized enterprises involved uh, in the industry. However, uh, in many islands in Micronesia, because of the initial developments were large-scale developments, overseas investments, people seem to equate uh, tourism development with large-scale development. But of course it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, so that's kind of a misconception I think uh, uh, amongst many people in, uh, in uh, Guam, Saipan, Palau and many of the Micronesian islands. Uh, and also uh, another very important point is the importance of residents, resident buy-in for tourism to be succe uh, successful because tourists don't just visit places to see things, they interact with people and if the residents are not really buying into uh, you know, what, what's being offered, then, then you're not going to have a successful industry. Um, you're not going to have the repeat visitors. Uh, during the recent uh, COVID pandemic um, experience, uh, there are some lessons that I learned and there are some, many, some interesting observations. 
Guam and many of the small islands in Micronesia pretty much shut down. There, were, there was no domestic tourism like you had here in Japan and in many other mainland communities uh, where people were encouraged to travel uh, domestically. So there was nobody coming in. And so businesses were forced to pivot, come up with new ways to generate revenue. And so uh, companies that were larger, uh, hotels for example, maybe retailers, they had to come up with, they had to rely on entrepreneurs, the, their employees, to come up with entrepreneurial ideas in order to continue uh, employing people and uh, to continue operating. So we saw that happening. We also saw a growth of uh, new small businesses, entrepreneurs, you know, coming on, on, on board and, and starting to re generate revenue when uh, Guam was pretty much shut down to the rest of the world. Um, I also want to talk about some development issues and challenges related to tourism and, and entrepreneurship. Um, tourism can be a positive engine for development, of course, if it's, if it's managed properly. Um, but there are some issues that need to be uh, considered. And, uh, number one, it's not just your residents that you're talking about now that you have to uh, uh, think about. It's also your tourists. And if you take a look at Guam's population of 154,000, and you add the 1.6 million people spread out throughout the year, and you do the simple math, it pretty much doubles the population. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, you know, you need to import things in order to service the, the tourists. There's a lot of import, you know, it's, Guam is an import dependent island. So just about everything is imported and there's waste uh, that, that results from all this importing. Uh, and so of course we need to think about the sustainability, uh, you know, principles. Uh, we need to think about how to manage waste, uh, et cetera. So how can entrepreneurship help with quality of life issues? Number one, food security. Uh, ha encouraging people to grow their own food, uh, encouraging people to farm. Um, there's also value added products industry that can be uh, very helpful. Um, using the materials that are already there instead of having to import things. Um, and we see this uh, being very successful in many destinations. Uh, this also, this creates uh, jobs, uh, there are opportunities for people to stay in their village without having to go to the central part of the island to go work. Uh, it also uh, trains people, teaches them skills, uh, self-reliance, etc. And, and something else that not everybody understands all the time is, is the tax revenue. Uh, when you have uh, entrep local entrepreneurs and people spend money, that money stays on the island. It doesn't go to a corporate office in Chicago or Tokyo or Seoul or, or some other place. So there's more money uh, that stays on the island, goes to the, gov the uh, government in taxes, and then people spend the money and it circulates. So that leads to uh, 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 improved quality of life for, for many residents. So having said all that, uh, I approach my co-author, who's the director of this new Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Guam, I asked him, well, who are our startupers? Who are our new entrepreneurs? And nobody has any data. Nobody knows who they are. You know, how old are they? You know, where are they from? What, what kind of education do they have? What kind of, how much money are they making? Nothing. So that's why we came up with this study. Um, and we, we had a questionnaire uh, that, that was uh, sent out to businesses with less than three years in, in operation and we, we, were, we, we, we really put a lot of effort into trying to get as many, uh, a voluntary basis, at, at, at as many entrepreneurs to fill out the, uh, the survey. So the survey took, took place between March and uh, December of last year and we collected de demographic data but we also wanted to analyze uh, the variables that you see up here, like the perceived business challenges, um, information about how they're doing, uh, the businesses, that is, and also the demographics. Um, I, I need to point out that Guam has about 3,500 registered businesses, but not all of them are active. You know, they just have a business license, not, not really active. Some of them are, are like rental businesses, rental condo, one condo unit. Um, so, 
I would estimate the number of uh, active small entrepreneurial businesses to be no more than 500 over the last uh, 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 three years. So I wasn't really thrilled about the, the response rate that we got. We were able to get 58, which is not much, but uh, you know, it's, it's better than nothing. So we did get some uh, information. Uh, 52 of them were complete, so we were able to use the data from uh, 52. Uh, and by the way, 64% were female, 36% uh, male, and I think that, that, that's uh, a common trend, right? Around the world, we see more female entrepreneurs. So I'm quickly gonna go over some results, uh, and uh, I really wanna get to the findings and conclusion. The results, you, you can get a, an idea of, of some of the information that we were able to gather. So we wanted to find out short-term business concerns, and, and of course, the business costs uh, with uh, you know, the current situation, you can understand that's the number one concern. And we used uh, uh, the gender as an independent variable, and we were able to see that there are differences in, in what people considered priority um, concerns uh, based on short-term and long-term. Long-term term is five years and, and later. Uh, business cost was number one for both male and female, but uh, different uh, priorities or concerns um, based on sex on the other, the gender on the others. Supplemental income, uh, what, did people rely on jobs uh, with over 30 hours a week or full, full time? We see more males, uh, a, a higher percentage of female, uh, males staying in their jobs before moving on and uh, different um, figures for the females. As far as uh, business support, we asked about uh, uh, how, how do people feel about uh, receiving support? Is it easy or, or difficult to get information about starting up a st small business and getting support? And it was kind of mixed. Uh, there wasn't a very strong um, response either way. Uh, support from governmental and non-governmental um, nonprofit agencies. Only about 32% uh, felt that they, were, they received support. And so we were able to find out, we dug a little deeper with another question, and we found out that they, people felt they got more support from other entrepreneurs. So they really valued the co-working communities like the entrepreneur hubs where the entrepreneurs can get together and networking uh, opportunities uh, with other uh, entrepreneurs, networking events uh, with other entrepreneurs. Demographics, no surprise, the younger uh, folks um, make up the uh, demographics uh, of the, um, the age groups of the, uh, of the uh, entrepreneurs. And then we looked at race and ethnicity. And uh, th this, is, uh, th this is interesting. There's more information that we really need to get from this. We use the U.S. Census Bureau um, uh, categories and um, we see that 66% identified as a Pacific Islander and about 24% as Asian. If you add the two, that's about 90%, and that pretty much represents Guam's population. Guam has about 37% uh, Chamorro uh, uh, and 26% Filipino, and then a Caucasian is 7%, and, and every, there's just a diverse group of people living on the island from various uh, Asian countries and also the islands. And I think we could dig a little deeper uh, and find out what islands uh, you know, our entrepreneurs are from or if they're uh, underrepresented um, islanders, we can possibly uh, assist them. And here's the revenue. Most of our entrepreneurs, the new ones that responded, uh, make under 10,000, but we have a few making over 100,000, so they're doing, they're doing okay uh, at over 100,000. Um, I also f should mention that 38% uh, of our entrepreneur uh, new startups are retail-based uh, companies and 16% pr professional services, 74% are home-based, and 22% rent a space. Now I intentionally show, put these pictures up because I wanted to, to show that this is what Guam looks like in two months. And uh, Dr. Mike Devakwa, uh, maybe Dr. Ikigami, you know Dr. Mike Devakwa, he's a his, our historian. He's written a number of uh, papers and book chapters on Guam's tourism industry and the history. 
And he talks about the need for indigenous entrepreneurship because our tourists come to Guam and they see a Las Vegas style uh, night, you know, nightclub, sandcastle dinner show. They see uh, Hyatt, they see uh, Weston, Outrigger, uh, European brand names, and you know, so where's the culture, right? Where's the, you know, what, where's the uniqueness of the destination? So um, that's another area. That's another reason why uh, we need to have uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, showcasing our, the, the culture uh, and, and making sure that it's authentic and that people have a, a, a pretty good experience. So we were able to find out, we have some emergent findings. This is a start. Uh, we know the, what some of the concerns are. Um, we, we understand the perceived level of business support, and so the Center for uh, Entrepreneurship and, and Innovation can encourage more networking activities with other entrepreneurs. We know what we need to do. Uh, also, the demographic data, age groups, uh, race, ethnicity, breaking it down a little bit more uh, is something that we need to do. Uh, one minute. Okay, so let me uh, let me wrap this up by just mentioning. Uh, you, you may have heard on the news about the super typhoon that hit uh, Guam on May 24th, and that was about a month ago. And there are still some people with no power and water. Uh, I live in the central part of Guam. I didn't have water for 10, 10 days or so, and then no power for over two weeks. And so again, we saw a number of entrepreneurs coming up. Uh, and providing food for people that don't have, you know, the refrigerator is not working. You have to buy food every day. So prepared food. So we, we see this entrepreneurship uh, happening. And, and when we talk about community, um, a small island re resilience, we need to include this discussion about encouraging ent local entrepreneurs. Um, so a regular review of the current data and uh, small business development is really important for small, uh, small islands, especially small islands. Um, limitations, I mentioned the sample size. We also had re reduced, uh, restricted availability due to federal um, guidelines with the Small Business Administration and also confidentiality clauses with some of the nonprofit agencies. Uh, but we plan to continue collecting data and, and uh, generating reports to help our islands develop in a sustainable manner and improve the quality of life for residents. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, thank you for that presentation. I um, guess there's a few more folks in the in the room. Um, so, if you have any any questions or discussions or observations for um, for, for, Do for Dr. Fred Schumann? Thank you. I have a question. My name is James Mr. Hansen from uh, Lund University. Thank you for the okay, interesting uh, presentation. Um, in the uh, social democratic countries of Sweden and Denmark, which are, in a, in a sense, uh, represent, we have an idea that uh, small island tourism should be uh, always locally owned. Uh, in that way, it would be more uh, social and environmentally uh, sustainable. Uh, when, when ownership is local, it's better. That's the, the, of the general idea uh, that we have. So this is really interesting, uh, but I was uh, wondering how much do this new class of uh, small entrepreneurs and startups, how much do they cover in the total uh, market, in the total operation, in the total uh, economy of tourism in Guam? Uh, and a second question could be, how easy is it uh, for them to get into the market? Are they allowed uh, by the bigger operators? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, for the online uh, audience. Were you able to hear the question? No? Okay. No. So let me, let me try to rephrase. So in, in countries like Denmark, they, they understand the importance of small businesses in, in islands and the ownership, business ownership uh, to be uh, uh, small biz local businesses. Uh, and uh, so, so the question was, uh, how challenging is it for uh, these small uh, local entrepreneurs to break into the industry? Maybe that's already established, right, with the larger businesses. And, uh, and that's a really good question. Um, I, I think uh, the way that uh, the business, the industry uh, was uh, operating in the earlier years, like in the 80s and 90s, 
they're hyper competitive amongst each other, the larger companies. And, uh, but I think the times have changed and uh, many of these larger industry leaders, you know, the larger companies, they, they know that they need, they need the small businesses to help support, help attract our visitors. Our visitors now are more uh, sophisticated. Uh, they're not, they're not going to just do the things that, uh, you know, the, the mass tourists used to do. And so I think in some ways it's, it's evolved uh, to, um, so that there is a place for, for the smaller businesses. It's a very good question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting. And I don't connect with what we were talking about yesterday in the conversation about the geography, like how entrepreneurship is becoming a way to get people to stay in more rural or peripheral areas, whether it's newcomers in my case, or probably in your case, to be more like local people, I suppose, or maybe returning migrants from the city. So the, the, there were two things that I found really interesting about your presentation and your data. And that one is the perception of risk and uncertainty, especially long-term risk associated with the business, and I think it was mainly among female um, entrepreneurs. And the second one was the importance of the, um, the networks of support among entrepreneurs. So, two questions. So, is there any kind of support to, um, to get people, especially maybe female entrepreneurs, but not necessarily studied and supported when they encounter these kind of issues? And second one, what kind of forms of maybe formal and informal networks or hubs are there for entrepreneurs, especially maybe outside of the more like the larger cities? Sure. Uh, online folks, were you able to hear? Question? No? Okay. So let me see if I can remember. First question was about female support, the, the female entrepreneur support. It, th does it exist? Is there some sort of mechanism for them to? Right to to receive uh, uh, assistance. Well, not necessarily just for female. But okay, for yeah, for entrepreneurs, and also for um, the other question had to do with uh, people that live in rural areas, and and you know what kind of uh, support is there? So also the how kind of support for networking and meeting other entrepreneurs. Right. Okay. So a very good again, good question. Uh, you may find it interesting that we have a, a Guam Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. But there's also a women's chamber of commerce. I don't know how many places have a women's chamber of commerce. So you know, so we, we tend to say there's a men's chamber of commerce and a women's chamber, but there is one. And, and so they actually provide a lot of support. And they seem to be even more active than the regular, the, the older, uh, the old boys network uh, uh, chamber of commerce. So, so there's that. Uh, there's also, um, um, programs, uh, for, for example, I was involved in the One Village, One Product uh, strategy to, to encourage that in uh, Guam. And those of you that are living in Japan, you probably know about OVOP. Yeah. And it's, very, very, it's been very successful in, in places all around the world. And so we're trying to create opportunities for people that live in the villages so you don't have to come to Tamuni, the central part of the island. You can, you can stay uh, in the southern part uh, learn a skill, uh, create something, and sell it on the side of the road, roadside stands. Uh, and then uh, uh, even DFS, the major retailer, duty-free retailer, they're encouraging uh, small businesses to come up with local souvenirs. Uh, there's grant, grant opportunities for people to uh, learn and to produce uh, souvenirs because things are being imported from other countries for souvenirs. I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about some of those uh, souvenirs, like the man in the barrel and the woman in the barrel, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, yeah, so, um, so those are some really good uh, programs for um, many of our residents. Thank you. Okay, the time is up. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you, so, um, uh, Moving on to our next, uh, I think, final speaker, is that correct? Yes. Um, and so, okay, and so we have coming up uh, for our next speaker, Dr. Um, Usha, I hope I correct, uh, pronounced that correctly, Dr. Usha Harris is an environmental communication educator and researcher. She is visiting faculty in communication and media department at the University of Central Asia, teaching courses in environmental communication and science communication. 
Research is focused on Pacific Island communities' use of participatory media to raise awareness, climate change, impact, uh, and adaption. Uh, Usha's numerous publications can be found on Google Scholar. You can find that, uh, that link in your, um, in your program. And her talk today is a model for building resilience in island communities. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I will uh, try and share uh, my video here. Um, so let's hope that um, this works. If not, then I will depend on uh, Mo to oh. show what is already there. No problem. Let's try. Yeah. So, um, OK, I think I need to. Uh, also, remember to share the audio. Uh, okay, so I do share the audio, okay. Um, I'm just trying to bring... Okay, so it says host a disabled oh, participant sorry, sorry. screen sharing. Okay, now you will be able to share. Please go ahead. Alright. Well, I'm unable to... Find it just one moment. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you see that? Yes. All right. Okay, I will play this and I'm hoping there won't be too much um, feedback. <laughs> Uh, I think we can't hear the audio, Usha. Uh, okay, so my audio is on. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll just get you to uh, okay. share it. All right, no yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll share from my side. Greetings to my fellow participants. In this presentation, I'll share with you a participatory model for community resilience building. But first, let me begin with a story. I'm in Kiribati, the island group in northern Pacific just above the equator. The small six-seater plane lives off the runway, which spans the widest part of the main island of South Tarawa. As the plane reaches towards the sky, I look down at the serpentine land below, barely above the water with a lagoon on one side and the open sea on the other. The plane is barely in the air when it begins its descent again towards another low-lying coral atoll. After an hour-long bumpy lorry ride, we arrive in Tebontibeke on the island of Abiyang. The story belongs here to a woman named Maria Decay. Maria leads us towards the sea to a place where her family once lived. The rocky outcrops in the sea was the road which once encircled the point where Maria brought up her children. She tells me her story.
Maria's story is one of many now facing humanity due to unraveling disasters caused by a changing climate. Extreme natural disasters are occurring in all parts of the world. In March 2021, my family and I suddenly found ourselves in one of the worst floods to affect the mid-north coast of New South Wales in Australia. After living through terrifying fires of 2019, our community was devastated yet again. But unlike Maria, who has no one to turn to for her help, we were supported by a well-coordinated network of volunteer organisations. With natural disasters increasing in regularity and intensity, a range of information and communication tools is necessary as a lifeline in emergencies and long-term sustainability of vulnerable communities. Communication has been identified as the single most important link during emergencies on and for future planning against natural disasters. What communication models can we develop for effective collaboration and whole of community participation in building community resilience in the face of these challenges? In this presentation, I offer a model which I have developed after years of observing and living with Pacific communities who must rebuild their lives after recurring cyclones and floods. The model places dialogue and collaboration at the centre of resilience building. This participatory environmental communication or PEC approach enables a shift from binary frameworks towards a more holistic and networked communication model that includes voices of diverse stakeholders. The model has three key attributes diversity, network and agency, or the DNA essential in the healthy functioning of both natural and human environments. Scholars from broad disciplines have discussed the importance of diversity, network and agency as individual concepts. Collectively here, diversity plus network plus agency open a dynamic space for dialogue and collaboration, which is at the core of this model. The DNA model encourages cross-fertilization, forges new relational links, and inspires problem solving. Now I'll discuss how the DNA framework can improve our responses to environmental challenges. Diversity enables innovative and transformative thinking. The term here means both difference and inclusion of a broad, broad range of factors and actors, different knowledge systems, sociocultural values and beliefs, abilities, talents, demographic variables such as age, gender, class, ethnicity, and the non-human world, including ecosystems, technologies, and tests. This means valuing indigenous knowledge alongside uh, methods, li uh, listening, alongside scientific methods, listening to a diversity of voices before designing solutions with affected communities, while also being mindful of the natural environment. Networks are a complex system of relationships connecting both human and non-human worlds. They include vertical and horizontal human networks, as well as non-human networks such as river systems and forests and life forms that live within. Because, as we know, humans are but one part of this in intricate web of creation and not separate from it. Networks are critical during emergencies and long after they have passed. Mapping of participatory networks can include a wide variety of groups such as neighbours, neighbourhood centres, volunteer services, faith organisations, health workers and even local shop owners alongside those listed on the slide here. 
Agency is an action or a doing of human and more than human entities, which leads to an effect or outcome. Agency in the natural world contributes to the efficient working of an ecosystem. Human agency results from a realization of our own power and potential through dialogic encounters that act as the catalyst for change. And these can include, of course, environmental activism, uh, small acts of uh, uh, planting your own vegetables and serving the community. Communication is central in collaboration and dialogue. Communication processes that encourage greater participation may include anything from community forums, folk theatre production, community radio, to everyday devices such as smartphones. And these can be used to start a conversation about the environment in which communities live. Bottom-up dialogic initiatives enable integration of indigenous narratives and cultural practices through dialogue with other community members, discussion with environmental experts, and by researching traditional adaptation methods, vulnerable communities learn how to plan for future disasters. The DNA model empowers people to find solutions from within their own communities while working with regional and national disaster agencies and environmental experts. The model can be applied in environmental management, planning, education and awareness raising, and disaster risk management. If humans are to survive in an increasingly hostile environment, we need to act collectively. The DNA model allows voices of communities, such as Maria's and my own, to have a say in designing more resilient communities and by implication gaining control of our own lives. Further discussion of this model can be found in my book, Participatory Media in Environmental Communication, which is published by Routledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Usha. Um, Thank you. We have, we have some questions uh, from the, the room or from the online group. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, we have a question from Valia, just a minute. Do I need to go closer there so they can Thank you all, a wonderful panel. Um, Usha, hello. Usha is my friend. Hello. <laughs> I hope I can understand. <laughs> anyway, this is really interesting because we, were, we heard from the Guam presentation, and yours, Usha, is a stronger presence and involvement of women at all levels of island life now. So in Guam, we have a stronger uh, entrepreneurial activity that has resulted in a women's association. Huh, you know the old boys school you said network now is being, you know, not replaced but added on. And also Usha, you, you talked a lot about um, also women's um, participation and involvement in mitigating climate change. So are we seeing here a trend in island communities where women's voices not only getting stronger but also more effective in the engagements they they they, they get part of in this island? Or is my wish And that's that's a question for both um, Guam and uh, Ushka. Ah, uh, she said it's. Um, mm. Do you want to engage? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, Bali is, uh, uh, when she put down the microphone, it was much more clearer. So if I could, uh, <laughs> I, I, my apologies, but uh, it was, I understood that there was something to do with women's participation 
and women's voices, but I couldn't quite uh, get to the crux of the question. So, uh, if I speak now, can you hear me? That is that is wonderful. That's ah, okay. Yeah. Well, now we know. After a day and a half, you know, we figured it out. Technology. No, I was just saying that we had a presentation just before you from Guam, uh, showing how women's entrepreneurial activities are increasing, and they are not only increasing but also getting more organized. And in your diagram, DNA diagram on on networks, you had their women in a separate block, right? So my question is, are we seeing, is this a trend in the islands where women's voice not only is getting stronger, but also more effective? Okay, thank you, thank you for the question. Um, yes, I think women are taking a very leading role in, uh, uh, especially when it comes to uh, post-disaster um, uh, areas. And, and the unfortunate thing is that uh, a lot of, um, post-disaster management uh, and uh, emergency uh, sort of decision-making rests with men still in Pacific Islands. I can uh, really talk about Pacific Islands here. Uh, and uh, sometimes it is a struggle for women to get their voices heard. But when you are going and talking to women and the communities at, at uh, the very sort of ground level, uh, you can see that women play a very leading role in uh, building resilience of the communities. They, they are uh, at the forefront of building uh, their families back, you know, uh, and, and in group situations as, as well in terms of getting food and clothing and so forth. So I think at a very ground level, yes, women uh, play a major role. Uh, in keeping the family together and providing emotional support uh, uh, while also having issues with mental uh, health, you know, which where in, in many cases are uh, post-emergency and having gone through it myself, I know that mental health can be a big issue with communities such as ours and, uh, uh, and not only in Pacific Islands, but even in my community, you know, I, I saw that. So, um, so uh, to, as, as a reply to, to you, Balia, uh, women have always played a very strong role uh, in, in these situations. What we need now is for uh, decision makers to realize uh, and to bring in women's voices in, into the mix. And adding to that to our colleague from um, uh, Cayman Islands, because Jeanette, you talk about policy and climate change. Is there anything there in terms of gender or women's involvement in the Cayman Islands that you're aware of? No, nothing that is visible. I know that in other parts of the region there are targeted approaches for women's involvement in climate change movements and adding to the conversation and advocacy, but I have not seen a distinct women's social movement in the Cayman Islands in relation to driving and advocacy with climate change. And uh, thank you very much for the, this panel from four locations from the world. And uh, wish you have a good day and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.